we've been through a very tough time from an investment perspective and even for founders especially in the last two years forget everything you knew about fundraising from 2021 2020 because it doesn't hold water at all i actually think that we're going to see even more companies continue to fail in 2024 Companies definitely can't raise at the same valuations that they used to. Building in crypto in the bull market and yeah. building in crypto in the bear market are two completely different things. Yeah. What's up, everybody? My name is Benjamin. Welcome back to 2024 with our Build Our Africa speaker series. Today, I'm really excited because we go all the way to Lagos, where I was told it's home of the original jollof rice and all this stuff, but also told there's no power. So, <laughs> you know, I've, I've heard both sides of the story. Anyway, today we've got an exclusive with Yele, it's somebody I've known for about maybe six to seven years now. And we first met because I saw his website uh, called Microtraction where he was helping fund uh, early stage uh, tech companies. And I went and applied for as Nala. And then we got on a call maybe the next day or a few days later. And, uh, you know, we had a discussion about him investing in Nala. And so we'll start with that one before we jump into Nestcoin bundle and the entire journey from Binance and all around the world. Uh, really inspiring. Yella, welcome to the Build Africa show. Thanks for having me, man. It's good to finally be on on the show and it's good to see you looking good uh thanks man i'm just you know <laughs> if 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 i could only get 10 percent of that yellow energy i'd be in a whole nother <laughs> mood every single day um but tell me about our first conversation uh um, i remember where i was i was in dar es Salaam, tanzania i was on whatsapp <laughs> and we were speaking yeah yeah i mean i think like first things first i was like how did you find out about my contraction <laughs> because i think we had, we had just launched and then you were like the first one from outside of like like Nigeria. And so I was just super excited to be speaking to, to <laughs> you and like, you know, um, it was a great conversation, man. I always say that like, I wish, you know, like, I think I, I think I'm quite good at convincing founders to, <laughs> to take our money. And, you know, Nala is definitely one of my, uh, regrets or like oh. my misses in terms of like not investing, but I'm, I'm so, so, so proud yeah. of like, you know, what you've done and just like the resilience that you've shown. And I, I think like you're, you're definitely one of the more resilient founders that I've come across, you know, so. Wow. That's very kind. Um, I did not expect the yellow to, to come and almost get me in tears over here. <laughs> um, but no, it's, it's true. So basically how, how I originally heard about yellow and micro traction was I had just moved back to Tanzania and mm. was looking at, okay, I'm broke. I don't have a job. I'm staying at home with my mom. I'm trying to build this company called Nala with no funding. I'm like applying for random grants here and there. And I was just like Googling VCs in Africa, you know, grants in Africa. And I had a whole spreadsheet. And then I was like, grants in Nigeria. Cause like maybe it's happening over there. And I saw this, it said micro traction. We invest. We're like the first check in. We'd really yep. support founders and all this. Then I was reading about it and I was like, wow, they've got companies to YC. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Uh, cause you know, I had at this point, I think I applied like three times to YC mm, and got mm, straight rejected. So mm. I was like, okay, let me, let me apply. And so that's actually how I, like, nobody told me about you guys. I was just like wow. Googling and just curious to like find. SEO, man. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that SEO worked pretty well. Um, so let's, let's take it all the way back. So mm. home is Lagos originally. Yeah. 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 So well, technically I was born in Ibadan, Ibadan, which is, uh, in Oyo state. So it's about. I mean, the roads are better now, but it takes about two hours, um, kind of like door to door. Mm. Um, and so I grew up in Ibadan, um, and I only actually lived in Lagos after I moved back to Nigeria from school. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like my, my, my background, but most people think that I'm from, mm. I'm from like Lagos, but I actually was born, born in Ibadan. So how does one get from, okay, so first of all, I heard that you are the only son out of like many children. Is that, is that true? <laughs> or is it a few si siblings? Yeah. Yeah. So I have, I have, uh, five sisters. Okay. Um, man, your parents are just waiting <laughs> for, for that one son. They're like, man, we've got to get that son. Let's have another baby. Oh, it's oh let's have another one. Wow. <laughs> we got to talk to your parents about that one. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I'm actually not the last born, but I was second to the last. Um, 
was the but, last that was my laugh to your son as well. No, no, no. The are we finally? <laughs> um, but she's actually like one of the smartest, the smartest people that I know. Actually, like my younger sister. Mm. Um, but yeah, I was the only, only, only boy, um, and grew up with like um, a lot of like you know women in my life and mm-hmm. things like that. Um, but I went to boarding school, which was actually where I kind of began to pick up some really early skills in terms of like just knowing how to, um, I don't want to say like influence people, mm-hmm. but like, you know, you you learn a lot about like, just like how to talk, how mm-hmm. to get your way, how to navigate like difficult situations because, yeah. you know, but in school, like you're nine yeah. and then there are people that are like much older than you and things like that. But it was, it was, it was really fun actually. So, mm. yeah. So talk to me about, so board, boarding school, then, you know, you go from, you know, Ibadan, right? Mm-hmm. And all the way to London, mm-hmm. I hear, for, for university, yeah. where you studied medicine. Yeah. How how did you get from there to London to, to study medicine here yeah. at Kings? So, I mean, I think like, um, unlike most people, my parents didn't actually push me to study medicine, mm. but... When I think about the things that I'm interested in today, mm. they didn't even really exist in Africa at the time. Like, mm. what was crypto or venture capital or investing? Like, these were completely new to me. So, if you were doing well in school, literally it was, you know, um, study medicine or engineering or architecture and all of those things were that interesting. Um, my dad was a doctor. My, my aunt, my uncle, my uncle, my sister wanted to do medicine. Mm. I was doing well in biology. And so it was kind of like this thing of, let me do this until I figure out, you know, what I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I definitely had the privilege of, you know, living in Nigeria and um, uh, coming to the UK to to, to study. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always felt like I would figure it out, like figure out what I wanted to do. In fact, mm-hmm. I remember when, I was applying to medical schools. I chose King's because King's had an exit degree. Mm. So even though in quote, like I dropped out of medical school, I, I do have a degree in medical sciences. Mm. Now don't ask me what the, don't ask me what the <laughs> Yo, certificate so, is. because like So, I'm not, so do, Dr. Yele is offering free healthcare <laughs> advice. So, you know, in every African family, you always have that one doctor where lo- if anything lo- goes wrong, we, we call them. <laughs> Luckily for me, my sister is a doctor <laughs> okay, actually. Okay. So, so we have- Somebody in the family had to take the Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we have, we have a doctor in the family. Um, but, you know, it was interesting. I think like most Africans never actually- practice mm. professionally what they studied mm. you know especially like in tech like most people didn't learn it in school you kind of like just stumbled into it right mm-hmm. um but that's kind of like what 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 really happened um i think i've always been someone that was driven by impact mm. wanted to help people um and medicine was kind of like the only vehicle at the time that felt that combined entrepreneurship with like helping people mm. Um, but then if you think about it as a doctor, you can only help one person at a time. Mm. When you build technology, it creates leverage to help as many people as possible. Technically, it's potentially infinite. Mm. As you mean, you can get everybody to use your products in the world, which we know is impossible. But um, I think like that has been like a constant thing in my life. I'm always asking myself, what I'm doing right now, is this the most optimal way to help as many people as possible? Mm. Is also why I've become like really interested in this idea of public goods and mm-hmm. very inspired by India. But like, you know, my 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 life and my journey and the decisions might seem like a bit haphazard, mm-hmm. but like that has been a constant theme in terms of saying, how do I find how do I find the thing that generates the most happiness for me as an individual? Mm-hmm. But I think about my own happiness in terms of impact, you know, in terms of like how many people am I being able to help um, as a result of like what's, what I'm doing. Um, But yeah, so that's kind of like my. Yeah. So, so you decide to drop out of medical school. Yeah. Actually, I met some of his classmates from medical school here in London. Like, hey, do you know Yelly? I'm like, of course. Who doesn't know this guy? Um, here in London, just randomly. Um, so you decide to drop out of medical school, and then shortly after, you start micro traction. Yeah. What gave you that inspiration to look at? Hey, look, there's this ecosystem of brilliant founders who are getting under, not funded, maybe over mentored, mm. 
and you decide to like, hey, look, you know what? Let's figure out a way to back these founders. Yeah. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, Microtraction is one of the most successful VC funds across Africa. They probably have brought the most companies from the African continent to Y Combinator, but also where those companies have gone to raise further rounds of funding and also probably hold the record for the amount of like money or you know impact those those companies have made um, across Nigeria, but also many other African countries. So very impressive what the fund has been able to do. And you've got some very impressive LPs, uh, you know, from um, Michael Sable from YC to... Um, you know, Alexis Ohanian uh, from 776 Ventures, uh, the Mickey co-founder Marker, of Reddit. Ribbit. Who else? So Mickey Marker, the, the founder of Ribbit Capital. Okay, M- Mickey is also an investor. And, and yeah. quite who, who else would be LPs in there that, that <sighs> people may know? I mean, um, Mr. Folawio is like a really well-known kind of like African mm. business business lead, mm. a business leader. Um, who else do we have? I'm 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 drawing a blank now. Yeah, no, okay. like, yeah, yeah. But but yeah, we have we have you know I think our LP community was focused on trying to get people that could give our founders like access. Mm. Um, and you know we're fortunate to just have like some of the. How many companies have you guys invested in? Seventy. Seventy. Yeah. Wow. In about ten different African countries. Yeah. It's- could have been seventy one. <laughs> <the guy, laughs> could have been. Could have almost, <laughs> almost invested in Tanzania. But next time, next fund. <laughs> I think we have, we have a we have, we have a company in TZ. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. They uh, do. They do. Um. Is it a public investment? Yeah, I believe so. Um. They do. It's like a, um. Banking as a, banking as a service. Okay. Tembo. Um, yeah, Tembo. That's yeah. Nala alumni. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Uh, amazing, yeah. cool. Well, shout out to Tempo uh, and and really cool. So, how did you get from? How do you even think about like? Okay, look, this is what I want to start. You mm. know, I want to set this up for other founders. What mm. was that process like? I mean, so I think after I left medical school, um, I went through this journey of trying to start um, my own startup and trying to raise capital. Mm. Um, was that purple? I, that was purple. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how you found about that, but <laughs> you know, Purple was like my the first thing I tried to build was a social app for university students, and it sounded like more like a dating app. <laughs> it sounded like Yelly was trying to accomplish his hopes and dreams, but he's still single, y'all. Anyway, so yeah, back. <laughs> um, you know, so he was. I mean, technically, like given the way it was structured, it could have been used as a dating app because yeah. it was about connecting and meeting meeting new people. There so. you go. There's always a plug somewhere. <laughs> but um, I, I realized just how difficult it was to go from zero to one. Yeah. Um, and so when I moved back to Nigeria, I, you know, met with someone called Dotsun Lopork, who is um, currently a partner at Ventures Platform, another mm-hmm. kind of like well-known um, African pre-seed fund. Um, and, you know, at the time, Dotsun started this community of pre-founders and it was meant to be, um, where you go to to learn how to start a startup, how to start and how to grow a startup. And we used to do these events that would connect founders to investors. Um, and, you know, we would curate these investors, we would curate the founders, but not, not deals were being done. So I remember the summer of 2016, that was when Michael Sibo and Kasa Yunis came to uh, Nigeria for, I think it was called YC in Lagos. Mm. Um, and, you know, we also curated some companies um, which ended up getting into um, YC. And so, you know, he was basically encouraging all the local investors that why don't you guys start, you know, very simple um, investment vehicles for technical founders or people that have built something to 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 get access to capital. Mm-hmm. And so I remember sort of like my journey as a first time founder trying to raise capital and how difficult it was i didn't know where to get started it felt like it wasn't really clear what these found what what these funds were looking for um and then i also remembered sort of just the difficulty of matching angel investors in lagos to early stage companies so the idea was to kind of create like something that was inspired by yc Mm -hmm. in terms of like the accessibility and the fact that you could apply from anywhere you didn't need to know you know any of the partners Mm -hmm. um but then not have like the whole sort of incubator like cohort type thing because yeah the ecosystem was so early that I was even sure we could put a high quality cohort mm. together. And that's kind of like what's what's the micro traction. And 
you know, I think one of the biggest innovations in micro traction was the way we structured it. Mm. So most micro funds at the time, you couldn't get enough management fees for it to make sense. So if you raise like, let's say 1 million or 500K or 200K, like how do you support the fund? So our idea was very simple in that we, we raised, you know, 500K initially when we started the whole process and about 100K of that was for the expenses of the fund. Mm. And then 400K was for investing. And, you know, when we deployed that capital, we we essentially used the hundred k almost as like an like an investment as well. Mm. So it's almost like we deployed that hundred k for the management fees, mm-hmm. you know, into a company, mm. and that made it like sustainable. Mm. Um, and we we kind of open sourced that model and told different VCs about it, um, which also sp- spread more and more precede um, funds being kind of like started up. And so, um, you know, I'm I'm quite happy to see just the change and the growth of like funding now, like, you know, when we started it was 15K, then it was 50K and now it's 100K. And like, you know, we're able to do some deals up to like 400K. And that's like in the space of like six, like wow. six years, right? So um, I think the ecosystem has come a long way. You know, we're, we've, we've, we've been through a very tough time from an investment perspective and even for founders, especially in the last two years. Um, but the ecosystem will kind of mature. You know, a lot of, the way we built companies was very kind of value centric. And um, I do think that there are other ways to build um, more sustainable, um, high growth African ventures. Mm-hmm. So microtraction, you know, 70 investments over the last six, seven years across uh, the continent. You said 10 different countries you've invested in. Mm-hmm. The last two years are probably really tough. <laughs> Um, not just for you individually well, you, as you're building your own company, but also for some of your portfolio companies within micro traction, mm. but also a lot of the ecosystem of people who look up to you and reach out to you like, Yele, what do I do here? Mm. What do you think has been happening and why? What's the consequence of what's been happening? Yeah, um, it's a really great question. So for you to understand what's been happening, you need to kind of understand like the macros. So we had a period whereby capital was cheap. Right, you had low interest rates at the time, um, which meant that capital was looking for yield, um, and you had sort of like private markets at public markets at all time highs, which also fed back into the private markets. Um, you know, so VCs were willing to invest um, at higher valuations, um, and because capital was cheap, you also had a lot of funds that were now raising even larger funds. We're willing to sort of experiment with um, sort of like an emerging market thesis. So in fact, a lot of the capital that came into the ecosystem wasn't from like African-based funds. It was a lot of like, you know, Western, US, European funds. Um, And, you know, because of like accelerator programs, you know, a lot of companies would go from like local investors go to an accelerator program, you know, raise at, you know, 20, 30 million dollar valuations, do a series A at like 40, 50 million dollars. But what then happens is that we had this massive correction, right? So we had, first of all, interest rates going up, which affected public markets. And then it created like a valuation um, um, sort of crash. Because if a public company in your vertical has lost 60 to 80% of the value, some of them were 90%, then how is your private market valuation holding up? Because the later stage investor is basically saying, okay, if I'm investing in this company today, you know, but the the public compar- comparable, I can only see like a 2X multiple, they're going to come down. And that then forces everybody to kind of like keep cascading down. So that was what happened in the US. From an Africa perspective, what was then going on was you had investors who were not Africa focused now looking at deals and saying, wait, this African company raised at a 10 million, 20, 30 million dollar valuation. And a US company in a similar market is raising at the same same amount. Like, why am I paying a premium for this African company? So that was one thing. Another one was that because those investors were doing like exploratory investments, you know, when things 
like when things really became hard, they pulled back, right? You also had VCs that weren't able to raise sort of like their next fund, you know, or in their next fund, the LPs are like, oh, don't do, um, you know, exploratory or frontier market investing. Um, and that just meant there was less capital, right? So I actually think that we are going to see even more companies continue to fail in 2024. I don't think, you know, VC doesn't re- doesn't recover as quickly as 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 um, the public market. Mm-hmm. It takes it takes some time because you need to go through that same cycle, yeah. but then the cycle is even slower. Yeah. So you're seeing public market recovery. Some people are some people are still some people are, are even bearish on the macroeconomics. You don't think like we are at the bottom of things yet. Mm. Um, obviously, I'm not that smart to be able to call. But where do you think we actually are? Are we at the bottom of the funding cycle? Like, or? No, I, short term, I can't, I, can't, I can't really tell, right? What, but what, what, I, what, 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 what I know right now is that companies definitely can't raise at the same valuations that they used to. Um, deals are taking a lot longer to, to close. You know, you can be a company that is raising today and trust me, they will be in the market in three months. Right, it's very rare. Like back then, you could start a process and you're done in like a month. The only way you, that happens today is if you bring down your valuations to like what people are seeing, you know. So now, when I speak to founders, I'm always like, forget everything you knew about fundraising from 2021, 2020, like 2020, 2021. Forget all of that because it doesn't hold water at all. Um, and a lot of global VCs are now sort of like a bit more skeptical about Africa and they're trying to see how some of their early investments will play out and if those investments don't play out properly they are less likely to kind of like take on new bets um but the positive is that we're seeing kind of like growth stage funds being raised specifically by african investors so we're gonna have a more kind of like african vc stack that can take you from like angel stage all the way to like you know growth stage but if you speak to most african growth stage vcs like their expectations on founders is completely different than what you see in the US. Teach right? What do you mean? Um, it's just they want to see a lot more, you know, like uni economics, um, governance, um, sort of like profitability or close to profitability. And these are things that maybe in the US investors two years ago would not have asked for it. And even in the US, some investors want to see that, right? Um, so, my view, if I was starting a company today, I'll focus on sort of businesses that have a have very positive unit economics um, and can get to profitability if the founder wanted. Like they, the fact they're not profitable is, a, is like a choice. That is, they're deciding to spend more to kind of like acquire customers at a faster clip. But even that is quite risky because if something goes wrong and you have such a high you know, um, sort of cost structure. It's very difficult to kind of like reel that back. Like it's probably one of the hardest things like any entrepreneur can do. So I would probably cautious kind of like that growth at all, at all cost mindset. And I would encourage founders to sort of focus on trying to be profitable. I know for my business, like I'm like, in my mind, if I can't get profitable by the end of this year, then like, you know, what are we doing? You know, so everybody in the company know that knows that this is, this is like the year of like revenue and profitability, hands down. Mm-hmm. So I know we went into the whole segment just around VC funding and, and my micro traction. After that, you went and joined Binance Labs, mm. uh, where you're like the director for Africa for, for Binance, uh, for, for all their investments they're doing um, and, you know, different companies you invested in across there. And what was that like? What was that experience? Yeah. To be honest, like, um, I loved, I loved the experience at Binance, man. Like, um, I kind of imagined that that's what it felt. Um, if you were part of like a Facebook or like an Uber or like a Google in the early days, um, differences that was remote, right? So I think Binance was probably one of the fastest growing remote companies that reached like a billion dollar valuation. So I joined Binance as maybe like employee 200 and something, maybe 230. Um, and I was the first hire for, for Africa at the time. The entire company was in one Telegram group. Mm. You know, you can imagine how big Binance is today. 
Um, but what I loved about the culture was like, it was hardcore, right? Like, and I, like, I love to work hard, like, you know, um, and, um, I had a ton of freedom and flexibility, you know, they, uh, the team or like my, um, Ella, who was the head of labs at the time, just gave me like the mandate of investing in African companies. And then they trusted me. They're like, you're the expert figure out what we should do, the structure in the deal terms. And it was, it was amazing. It was almost like running, running your own private kind of like fund, you know, it was such a, such a, such a great time. Yeah. So the market's evolved a lot mm-hmm. and you've probably seen, given you said private markets and public markets have adjusted massively, you've seen great reductions. What is your advice to a portfolio company or maybe a founder who's watching this show? about what they should focus on right now yeah. Uh, as they're building their company. Like say they got venture backed in 2021 or mm. 2022 mm. and you know, now what's your number one piece of advice for them? Yeah. I mean, number one is like get default alive as quickly as possible, right? Like create a path to profitability within 12 months and um, worst case before you run out of cash so that you're not dependent on venture capital. Um, that's like number one. Um, and change everything from your cost structure to, you know, um, your burn rate, um, to markets, your product to get there, because there's no guarantee that there'll be money at the end of that particular runway. So that's number one. Number two is if you have to go to the market right now, you have to kind of like accept that you might not get the terms that you want. Right. And investors are not trying to be mean or wicked. It's just like, you know, they know what, if you're a seed stage investor, you know what, you know, a series A investor is asking for mm-hmm. and you know what a growth stage investor is asking for. So, you know, like I always say, everybody can raise in this market. It's a function of valuation. I mean, not everybody. A good team mm-hmm. with a good product and market can raise in this market. It's just a function of valuation. So if you accept that in the public markets, you know, some public companies are trading at 50 to 80% of their all-time highs, you know, think like a public company and then accept mm-hmm. that the valuation haircut. At the end of the day, we tend to think in percentages for companies, but actually like that's the wrong way to think about it because if you have a company, the number of shares you have today does not reduce. It's still the same, yeah. right? So focus on increasing the value per share. Mm-hmm. And if you think about it from that lens of, okay, my value per share is currently, you know, $1. I want to make it $10. Don't think about like the fact that you've added more shares mm-hmm. in the company, you know, focus on the value per share. And if you do that, then, you know, that would help you get over that mindset hurdle. So those are like the two principal mm-hmm. things that I would I would say for any founder. Tell me about the first time meeting CZ from Binance. Yeah. So I think the first time I probably had a call with CZ was when I was about to, uh, actually, no. So I'd done a call, a group call in terms of like um, an investment committee. Right. These are the companies I want to invest in. Um, and I was presenting like representing like uh, the Africa deals for the incubation program. That was the first time. Um, and to be honest, it was something about trust. You know, like he had some opinions on the deals, but it was like, you know, you guys are the experts or you have you have boots on the ground. So, you know, we would trust you. But the the one on one or let's call it pseudo one-on-one conversation I had with CZ was when I was about to start Bundle. Um, and so it was myself, Way, the CFO at the time, and CZ talking about this idea of creating a really simple applications that would allow Africans to to trade uh, uh, digital assets. Um, and to be honest, I was like, it was very thoughtful. Um, he clearly had a very strong kind of like product thesis and like always focusing on like the main thing. Um, I don't think Sizi gets distracted a lot. Um, and yeah, that was kind of like my, my that initial kind of like reaction. Um, was definitely nervous, you know, because <laughs> obviously it's is a CZ, but, mm-hmm. but yeah, it was a good, good yeah. first chat, I guess. Yeah. So you saw, you were there, you said you were employee like number 200 and then. 230 something. And then when you were leaving, there were how many people at the organization? I have no idea, man. Okay. Like it scaled, it scaled was in the thousands. Like it okay. scaled. Wow. Incredibly fast. Wow. In that so period. lots of learnings as the organization continually evolved in a very, very short period of time. Yeah. And then you're building bundle. Mm-hmm. So 
talk to me about bundle like you built it and then all of a sudden i see on the news yell has resigned he stepped down from from bundle i text him like yo what's up man you're right like what's going on you know so yeah what happened yeah yeah, yeah let, before the resignation like t- tell me about the journey building and then like yeah why did you decide okay look it's time for me to step down yeah so i think that um bundle was such an interesting and amazing experience um hindsight is 2020 um and sometimes i ask myself like what did we do really well at bundle because bundle scaled to close to a million customers um you know we were gaining market share you know we used to even compare market share against binance we're not even comparing our market share against other players you know uh, and there were, there were days when we would do as much as 10 percent of binance's volume so um i think that there were a few things that worked really well so one was at the time no one had a very simple app to trade crypto you know those that were simple had like two assets right so we we were adding an asset like almost every day and we did that very intentionally with our design so the way we did our product and architecture we could add assets like really quickly there's a time when we we're the only ones that were offering a shib against the naira pair you know so shiba was like 40 percent of our of our volumes and revenue <laughs> in february or something crazy wow. like that right um um but you know when i was looking at the 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 market cycle we actually launched bundle at the start of the cycle and by the time i left it was like still the bull market oh. so there were lots of new people that were coming into the space and we were just the simplest and easiest app to trade crypto in the country and nigeria is the biggest african market for crypto um so it was it was it was it was amazing um i think when i think about why i stepped down um i think the primary reason was i felt like i had a lot of other ideas i wanted to pursue other things i wanted to build mm-hmm. and i wanted to build them kind of like independently from the binance ecosystem mm-hmm. right um so you know binance is a large ecosystem you have the binance chain binance smart chain a wallet and all these different types of things um and i felt like we had a bunch of ideas that were going to be public good infrastructure. I wanted that to be owned by um, sort of like the Africa community um, and also take on like other external investors, um, which was difficult to do because Bondo was kind of incubated within the Binance ecosystem. Um, what happened to Bundle since you left? Yeah, so I mean, recently there was a, uh, an announcement, maybe like in August or September last year, that they were winding down Bondo. Um, not too sure, kind of like about the the decision or the rationale, rationale there. Um, you know, but if I was to guess, it was probably just um, the fact that Binance had also launched Binance Lite at the time when we launched Bondo. There wasn't Binance Lite, right? So Binance had launched Binance Lite. Um, and they were kind of pushing that brand. So it didn't really make sense for them to have like two, mm-hmm. two, two brands or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, but you know, like it takes a lot of, speak a lot of Nigerians. They have such fun memories of Bondu. Like yeah. people, people love that product, yeah. man. I think you know. I'm still on the Telegram group for Bondu. <laughs> <laughs> Even I, mean, I Bondu, tried. Bondu, Bondu, Bondu had like, <laughs> like 25, 30,000 people in the community. Yeah. Like it was crazy, you know? So um, I think we've on board. I, I sometimes ask myself, like, man, can I catch lightning in the bottle twice? But it's yeah. not, is you know, building in building in crypto in the bull market and yeah. building in crypto in the bear market are two completely different, different. things. Yeah. You know. So so since you left mm. Bundle and Binance, how has that affected your relationship with CZ? Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Um, I haven't spoken to CZ in a while. Um, so I I have no idea kind of like how things are um on his side Mm -hmm. um but you know i think we left on pretty um amicable terms Mm -hmm. um and you know binance was a net positive on the ecosystem there are things that um you know one would wish was done differently and things like that but you know at the time if there was no binance in the african crypto ecosystem i don't think we'll be where we are um and 
super excited about sort of like just what I'm seeing, you know, the level of innovation, the quality of builders, the talent, the community ethos, you know, makes me really bullish about the ecosystem and like my decision to leave um, sort of the, mm-hmm. um, that, let me use the word, the, the, the Binance sort of like ecosystem, ecosystem, yeah. right? So it's, it's, it's kind of leaving that Binance ecosystem for a more nascent, yeah grassroots sort of like African crypto movement. So, yeah. yeah. So we talk about this Africa crypto movement mm. and you went and launched Nestcoin. Mm. And, you know, at the time, um, I, I see the vision was something like a DCG for Africa where you're investing into other companies uh, here and there. Mm. And, you know, tell me about Nestcoin, how that all got started. And yeah. Yeah. So... <sighs> Nescoin is, is such an interesting journey, man. Um, I when I when I left Bundle, I went to Ghana for a week. It was just be two weeks, and I was like, I'm not going to work. But whilst I was there, like I was talking to different people, investors. Everybody was asking, like, what am I doing next? Um, so I began to put together like this. You, you, you didn't add the building something new on LinkedIn. I didn't even know what I was going to do, but like it was a. It was, uh, it moved very fast, you know, like I had this vision of, like I said, creating this DCG for crypto. It felt at the time in 2021, like crypto felt like it was at this precipice of moving beyond trading and we're going to be a whole host of use cases. And, um, I'm a crypto permeable, like I believe so much in this technology and, you know, I wanted to create like, um, one of the defining companies in the space you know we raised a very large pre-seed round from you know pretty much every top african investor and global investor um and we were off to the races you know we were investing in companies locally and globally we were incubating companies in the sort of like um you know using stable coins on the back end but building like a fintech play we were doing something in gaming that raised you know, um, $3.2 million. Um, we were doing stuff in content. We were doing stuff in social. We were doing like DeFi stuff. Um, it was a, it was a very aggressive kind of like get big fast time. Um, and obviously like when, when the dust settles, you look back at that time and you really believe that you could have done things differently, but they always say hindsight is 2020. Um, I, I joke that like I feel like the last two years was uh, like a like a real life business school for me, mm. you know, like the school of hard knocks but for business, mm. um, because I had had you know different levels of in quote successes um, over the last sort of seven to eight years of my career, um, and this was like going to a whole different level and just really learning things anew um, and. I think for me, like one of one of the biggest lessons I learned is just this idea of resilience and and humility. Mm. Um, because you can drink your own Kool-Aid and you feel like you can't put any foot wrong and you know everything in the book, and then something like this happens and you're like, damn, okay, I need to be a lot more thoughtful and careful about like the actions that I take. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So I remember November 14th, 2022, <laughs> uh TechCrunch article states African Web3 startup Nescoin declared it held assets in FTX and lays off employees. Mm. This article comes out. What are you thinking? What's going on? Yeah. So, I mean, the article wasn't a surprise because we were very transparent with the whole um, issue or challenge at the time. Um, we, we were, I think for me, like, the decision that we made as a team um, was just one of transparency and sort of was transparency to our in to our employees, our investors, and to the community. We went to lead by example, um, and you know, I put out this 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 tweet, you know, that um, basically just shared what I told our investors. Um, and obviously that then led to like the TechCrunch article and things like that. But so one of your investors shared and leaked it to the in, uh, to the TechCrunch to TechCrunch. So it wasn't TechCrunch; it was Financial Times. Okay, wow. Um, so it was Financial Times that had like some information that wasn't public knowledge. Um, 
And it wasn't that we were like trying to hide how anything you, or not. But how do you feel when you shared that personal and private information where you're trying to be transparent and one of, yeah. the, one of your investors goes and leaks it to media? Yeah, I mean, like, I, I'm someone that always you know, like wants to build in public or wants to be transparent. Um, and it definitely was kind of disappointing to kind of see that. And, um, you know, it's... As, as, as an investor myself, it's something that I, would, I wouldn't do. You know, like, we know so much information about, like, our companies, but it doesn't mean that we then go and, like, publish those things. But, mm-hmm. you know, we didn't let it, like, to me, I didn't let it, like, bog us down. Like, we were caring, we we're thinking about, like, our employees. Like, these are people's lives that mm-hmm. a day ago, a week ago, were, like, perfectly fine. And then mm-hmm. now we're, you know, are impacted by the events that they had no, you know, um, no, control. no, 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 no control over, right? So that was like our primary focus, mm-hmm. and I was very thankful. I was just like, you know, thankful that that we we it was just us that was that was impacted, mm-hmm. um, and it's definitely made me think about like risk management, um, you know, very, very, very differently. Mm-hmm. You know, um, like Giannis, there's a story of Giannis that says he has like 17 bank accounts or something like yeah. that, right? So we're not we're not that. Yeah. Crazy, but like, trust me, like, we take it extremely seriously. Yeah. So, this news happens. You have to do this layoff of a bunch of people at Nestcoin and then go back into rebuild mode. Mm. All right. Um, so, firstly, what what's your thoughts on FTX and Sam and all of them? And yeah. then, secondly, like, how do you think of rebuilding after that? Yeah. I mean, I think first things first, like, I, I think about everybody that was affected mm-hmm. by it. Um, not even companies like individuals because a lot of people probably had like savings loved their money in there and like they've been like hampered for like a whole year so you know my heart goes that goes out to like everyone and like fortunately you know we're seeing more positive sort of like market sentiments in terms of like the value of claims i think they announced recently that uh, they you know the they're going to make an official statement um, at the end of this month on timelines for payouts so um things are looking up obviously like oh yeah later um and then you know in terms of like sbf um it, it really is a shame you know like a lot of people thought that this was going to be a a really great company and they were doing they seem to be doing well um so it's 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 just you know it's, it feels like a a breach of trust mm. Um, and it definitely dented sort of like people's faith and trust in the ecosystem. But I think for me, like it made me realize sort of just the initial virtue and ethos of crypto around like self custody, decentralization, building trustless systems. Um, and it's also what drives us at Nestcoin to try to create products that um, are still true to the ethos of, of, mm-hmm. of, of the digital currency space, um, you know, whereby a third party cannot do mm-hmm. what happened in like FTX. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but, but yeah, I think like, um, it was, it was definitely crazy to be in the, in the, in the eye of the storm for sure. Yeah. You know, now, now I can smile about it, but trust me at the time it was, it was far from, it was far from. So at the time when you're far. going through that and actually today, looking back and reflecting mm. is if Sam Bankman fried was right here in this room right now, looking at you, and you could only say one sentence to him, what would you tell him? Why? Like, why? Like, why did you do that? Like, it's, it felt like, it's like, it's like having, it's like having like a million dollars, but putting that million dollars at risk for a, like maybe an 80% chance that you will get like 1.3 million. And then a twenty percent chance that you will get like ten million, but the odds are you're gonna screw it up. Like, why you had so much going, going, going for you? Um, and I'm not sure he's been truly honest about like what what went down. But mm-hmm. the beauty, I mean, like personally, I don't even think too much about it these mm-hmm. days. Um, the big lessons for me were just like I said, resilience. You know, like. You, you don't really know yourself until you've been through like something really challenging. That's when you know yeah. 
you know what kind of substance you're made of um and um you know for anybody that's going through any sort of tough or any challenging time i think like what i would say is that it, it gets better like every single day you will notice as the days compound you feel a little bit less hurt you mm-hmm. feel a little bit less pain and you're able to focus on the future um and it's not because something miraculous or something something magical happens you know it's just like time heals mm-hmm. you know even the deepest of of of, of pains and when you were going pains. through all of that what was the hardest part letting go of my team um because like i said they didn't it wasn't really their fault you know and knowing that i'm impacting not just those people but the people that are also dependent on them financially you know family members siblings loved ones you know that definitely was the was the was the hardest part for me um i think like you know i'm also a very self critical person and i i ask a lot of questions things that i'll do differently why i made certain decisions um and you know i started this new practice of doing a retro mm-hmm. every quarter um and i've been very focused on improving like just the quality of my decision making and risk management mm. and i try to apply that framework to almost everything and um thinking about like what can go wrong um um you know to just kind of protect the downside mm-hmm. um but yeah. yeah so fast forward later um 2024 here we are um onboard so mm. net nest coin one of the key products your one of your flagship products you're pushing right now is called onboard what is onboard what does it do and yeah like what's yeah. the value proposition you're selling to customers yeah so onboard is a digital money app um but what's unique about onboard is that as opposed to like money that is sitting in a bank somewhere it's the the money is on chain um and you know that is the most secure way that you can keep your money um our parents used to keep money in like you know wood boxes yeah, and under the bed. safes yeah. under the bed and things like that and yeah. then we decided to put that money in the bank um but now money is digital which means that you know you can actually keep your money by yourself it's like a piggy bank piggy, piggy bank in mm-hmm. the cloud right um but we built a mobile app that just makes it really easy to sort of manage and keep control of your money yourself um and so one of the core use cases is this idea of giving everybody access to USD regardless of where you are um by the way for context for everybody who's watching africa's got the largest dollar shortage in the world we're in an import region we import way more than we export so therefore there's significant trade deficits across each country therefore you see this massive parallel market for currency exchange in the markets importers are trying to buy dollars there aren't enough dollars people are willing to pay premiums above in market rate for the dollars and there's consistent demand and most people don't want to hold local currency because the currency currency has been devaluing um multiple times over especially with the rise of inflation interest rates um so as as like it's a big problem uh not having dollars and not having access to dollars so yep. i i think it's really i just want to add that context, context. for people yeah. um i think it's really important for for giving people access to dollars so so yeah, yeah. so So yeah. so fun, fundamentally like that's kind of like what 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 the product does um but then the problem with like digital dollars or like stable coins is that it's not so useful right you can't spend it like money in a bank so we now give you a card that allows you spend spend that so like now if I'm in if I'm in the UK or in the US I have my onboard card on my Uber you know I order food I you know take rides mm-hmm. and things like that and then recently we allowed announced um 10% sort of like annual rewards on your USD. So once you sort of on ramp um or fund your wallet with from like local currency or deposit like USDC from like another crypto wallet, excuse me, you begin to earn interest on your on your funds. Um and so essentially like the you know, I believe that the in the future the same way how you when you you know get access to internet you open an email account mm-hmm. i think like in the future you will create like a e money account or a digital money account mm-hmm. um um probably before you get a bank mm-hmm. um and so you know we're we're in the early innings of this you know on chain um or like you know sort of 
internet, the internet sort of like native financial system. Like that's really what like blockchains are in a way. Yeah. Um, so that's sort of like what's so, what so if I'm in Nigeria, I can convert Naira to USDC and um, on on board. Yeah. And then I will earn 10% per annum on that. Yes. So about like 0.83% a month. Yes. Um, like on top of what my money is there. Yes, exactly. So that's great returns for me. Exactly. Okay. And then, and then you can spend it. And obviously, like, over time, we'll extend the functionalities. You can actually even still trade, you know, crypto assets. You can buy, like, more volatile assets if you're, if you're trying to get, like, higher beta mm-hmm. on sort of, like, the basic um, interest that we, that we, that we give. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of, like, what we're, what we're doing. It's been really incredible to watch the journey from there. And obviously, it's just the beginning, right? Uh, you know, you, you've had some big goals for this year. And... You know, looking back as we as we reflect on this conversation, uh, mm. I want to go on the personal element for you. Mm. What matters to you most in life, and why? Um, hmm. I think I've been pretty consistent with this, and that's just because when I left medical school, I did a very deep introspection, and I read. I have a blog post um, that I wrote on Medium. Um, it's called "How I Told My Mom I Was Leaving Medical School." And it was this letter that I sent to my mom just explaining kind of like my view on life and like what matters, what I'm optimizing for. And it's really interesting because the letter now is about uh, 10 years old and I still feel the same way. Um, And really for me, it's about optimizing for happiness and impact. Um, you know, if I'm in a situation whereby I, I f- I'm not enjoying what I'm doing, I'm going to request it. I'm going to make a change. Um, so I'm always optimizing for happiness, but then happiness is not like fleeting. It's not like a, it's not the same as joy. I'm not trying to get a high, you know, it's like long term. And what you realize about happiness is that it's not based on how much money you have or like how much stuff that you have. You need to find a deeper meaning of happiness. And for me, you know, that is impact, right? Like what gives me happiness is knowing that something that I've contributed or built for the world, um, built for Africa, built for the continent, for our people is helping other, like helping others. Right. So I believe that, you know, everybody has like a potential Mm -hmm. and if you have access to economic opportunities, you have access to financial services, you stand the chance of being the best version of yourself. And so that's kind of like what I optimize for and like what matters to me. And it's the single thread that connects um, um, everything. And, you know, sometimes you will go through things that are like really, really challenging and it makes you question like everything. And, you know, what, what makes you keep going is when you actually realize that like what I'm trying to do in the world is meaningful. Um, and, you know, you're able to kind of keep, keep pushing. So, yeah. So as we're wrapping up here, I've got a quick fire round of questions. Okay. So one, I, I, I told people on Twitter, I was interviewing you. Uh, and so some people had, I said, do you have any questions for Yele? And a few people had posted some questions. So I'm going to add a few of their questions to my quick fire round. Okay. First one is Bitcoin or Ethereum? Ethereum. Why? I can build... I mean, Bitcoin is changing now. You can, there's like L2s and you can build on Ethereum on Bitcoin. But like Ethereum is, is more than money, right? Ethereum, like Bitcoin is like digital gold. Ethereum is like a, it's like an internet computer that you can build any application and you can think of anything and put it on, on, on chain. Like that is very powerful. So, yeah. So uh, I learned you played some sports in high school. Um, so some important questions, basketball or football? Football. Even though I'm like six foot six. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, on his dating app, he's seven foot. <laughs> In real life, he's six foot six. Um, okay, so let's talk about that. So which football team do you support? Liverpool. Oh, man. Well, we need to end the conversation <laughs> right here. It's coming a big mistake. Uh, this guy's a Liverpool. Okay, Ronaldo or Messi? Ooh. Pick the right one. There's only one right answer. I'm gonna say Messi. Ah, killing me, bro. <laughs> killing me. Say, so you know, you know, it's, that, that is a very. I like, I like both players, yeah. and I, I actually didn't like Messi when I was younger yeah. because Messi, there was a Messi and an Argentina played, yeah, and it scored against Nigeria. So I hated him when he started. Um, but mm-hmm. yeah, I choose Messi, man. The World Cup win was just yeah. fantastic way to end a great career. All right, tea or coffee? 
Coffee. Why? Um, when I'm tired, I drink coffee. Okay, you like, actually think it helps? Like when I fly, like when I fly to a new country mm-hmm. in a different time zone, mm-hmm. I'm just like chugging coffee to keep me up. So I'll choose, I'll choose coffee. Mm. If you could meet any football player, given you love football Ooh. so much, uh, to take them out for dinner, who would it be? Yeah. They have to be active. Or no, it could be anyone. Oh, Steven Gerrard. Why? Istanbul, man. <laughs> 2005 Istanbul. This it's, guy is, it's, it's, that's all Liverpool got. It's history. That's, that's, that's nothing else. It's, it's called it's called heritage. <laughs> all right, very important one. Nigerian Jolof or East African Pilau? Ah, come on, man. Bro, you don't mess this up. You can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't ask a Nigerian that. Easy. Nigerian Jolof. Ah, he made a mistake. Guys, if you are in Kenya or East Africa using his uh, on board, please off board. <laughs> because the guy made the wrong a place, decision. There's a place in Kenya. It's called, I think it's called Jolof Kitchen. They have one of the best Jolofs that I've had in Nigeria. Yeah. In, in, in Africa, actually. Wow. Yeah, yeah, but it's owned by Nigerians, but it's amazing jollof, man. Yeah. So if you, if you want good Nigerian jollof, check out jollof kitchen in Kenya. Winter or summer? Ah, summer, man. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> He's like in London saying that. <laughs> uh, beach or mountain? Beach. Beach. Dude, I'm what? sun all day, man. But like, you told me you like reflecting and so on. So I thought yeah, you yeah I'll reflect on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Adidas or Nike? Ooh. Adidas, I have my Adidas. I love, I love Adidas shoes more, more, but I love, I love Jordans. Yeah. For Nike. And I love Nike the brand. So it's not an easy question, but just plain shoes. Forget the brand. Adidas. Adidas. Last time, now, last time I asked you this question, like three years ago when we chatted, I asked you, um, favorite upcoming Nigerian music artist. And you told me Thames. Really? That's crazy. Yeah. Is, is, that, is that sweet? That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it was three Ooh. years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I watched the video. I was like, okay, cool. Because I didn't even know her that well. Uh, then I was like, oh, who's this? Uh, yeah, so. Okay. Um, this is dope. Who, who would you say is the best African music artist today? Dude, that's hard. Um, okay, I'm going to say my favorite artist. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's a guy called Young John. Young John. Young John, yeah. Um, he's my favorite artist. Like, every song he puts out, like, I, like, I love it. But, I mean, Afrobeats has, has done far more than, like, everyone expected in the time that has done it. So I just think it's amazing to see all these guys do cool shit. But yeah, mm-hmm. I'll choose Young John as my favorite artist. Okay, and if you had to pick between hanging out with David or Whiskey, who would you pick? I'm not answering that question. Ah, come on, come <laughs> I'm on the like fence. That. I'm on the fence. What do you mean one. you're on the fence? I can't. I can't choose. <laughs> but 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 who, who has who has done more to Nigerian music, David or Wizkid? No, no, no. I can't answer that question. <laughs> I love, I love, I love, I love Wizkid's um, "Made in Lagos" album. I love Davido's like personality, energy, and just vibe. Mm. But like Wizkid's Wizkid's "Made in Lagos" was a freaking classic. Um, and you know, Star Boy album was a classic. So music and just memories and things like that, Whiskid. But Davido, man, it's just, it's like, it's a force of nature. Nice. So let's say you travel often, uh, quite to many different places. Mm-hmm. And, um, if you were to pick an American music artist to meet for dinner, who would you pick? Oh, American music artist to meet for dinner. Um, just one. probably Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre. Yeah. Why? I sold this company to Apple. Yeah. The yeah. Beats by Dre. And then like NWA. <laughs> I'm like an old, yeah. old school hip hop head, man. Found like, all of them. Eminem. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah all of yeah, them out. Yeah. So, so I would, I would, it would Dr. I just like a bit of very interesting kind of like conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And then if maybe, maybe, maybe Jay Z. But if I was like wanting to have like a crazy night. I'll choose Kanye because like Kanye is like <laughs> Kanye is Kanye, you know, like you'll be you you'll definitely remember that 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 dinner for, for 10, 20 years. <laughs> uh, given one of the African Cup of Nations, uh right now, mm-hmm. uh, who is Nigeria's greatest ever football player? JJ Okocha. JJ Okocha. For me, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Coach, I'll love I'll love to meet JJ Okocha. Yeah. And then I guess after him. Um oof. After him, maybe Kanu Wanko. Mm. Yeah. You don't you don't rate uh, Victor Osimian? 
he's still young, man. Yeah. Like, you know, there's yeah. a there's he has a lot to do. Like, yeah. it's still it's still early. It's like it's like calling out Messi when he was like 23. You, he has. I, I mean, and Messi was burning Ballon d'Or at 23, <laughs> so that's, that's, that's the difference. <laughs> Some well, of us were at home well, chilling. Well, she <laughs> made made um, Napoli win, win win the league, right? So he has he has a very high high kind of like potential bar. Mm. Um, but yeah, cool. As a wrap up, uh, any final parting words? Um, yeah. Um, for any entrepreneur who is kind of like struggling right now, um, I would say like keep going, um, stay resilient. Uh, it gets better. Um, just focus on kind of like staying alive. And if, you know, you're not able to make, um, make things work, like don't beat yourself up too, too much about it. Like, even the best entrepreneurs sometimes feel um, in one business. Doesn't mean that you're a failure. You pick yourself up and go again. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Wow. Well, what an incredible interview with uh, Yele. Yele, thank you so much. I've I've been admiring his work for many years uh, from our first WhatsApp call while I was sitting in <laughs> Dar es Salaam and he was in Lagos. And so till you know our last build africa interview like two three years ago um to watching you grow and going through the challenges that you've been through i remember when everything was happening i was whatsapping you and i was like hey you know how things going um layoffs obviously really tough to do and Mm. really um admire and respect how you've handled everything um i know it's definitely not easy and uh, i i understand building is very (laughs) tough especially across the african continent so you know, we just want to wish you all the best uh, with with everything you're pushing. If you're in Nigeria, if you're in Kenya, or you know, there's a couple other countries that onboard is live in. Please sign up, test it out, give them product feedback, email Yella directly, tell him what sucks and what's good. Yes, please. Uh, join that Telegram group. Uh, you guys have a Telegram group, right? Yeah, yeah. Great. Join the Telegram group um, and you know, jump in because that sort of feedback really helps us as founders become better. So. Uh, Don't take you watching this lightly. Uh, We really would appreciate your feedback. And as for me, that's a wrap. Asante Sana, even though he didn't say Tanzania was uh, (laughs) the best country he's been to in Africa. We'll let that slide. Um, Have you even been to Tanzania? No. He's not even been to Tanzania. Yo, we need to. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, yo, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Benjamin Fernandez. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye.